So tonight's topic is about how to use the products from your hive. We're going to talk about honey and wax, um, mostly just honey and wax. Um, Eric Baxter was supposed to be here tonight to talk about how to use a solar wax melter. He had to go out of town because his daughter was in a softball tournament. <clears throat> So I'm going to take over that part as well. <laughs> so to be, get really easy and to start off really basic because a lot of us are backyard beekeepers and when you're harvesting honey you maybe harvest one frame or two frames of honey or a bar out of your top bar hive if you're lucky enough to have one. Last week I had my biggest harvest yet and here's the wax that I have left over. I strained, I, this is a five gallon paint strainer bag that I bought at Home Depot. I bought it at Home Depot. I put it over my, my pot if I'm using the pot to strain it but now I have a five gallon bucket with a honey gate on it that I bought from South Florida Bee Supplies and that thing is awesome. So this was in my five gallon bucket dripping and draining and now I took it and I put it in this big giant pot. Okay I would tie the top closed, stick it in there, cover it with water, turn it on on the stove and let it simmer. All the wax is going to melt, it's going to come through the little mesh parts in the baggie and it's going to float to the top of the pot because wax is less, you know, it floats to the top, it's less dense. Then you're going to, when all of that, so you can mash it down in there to make sure you get the air bubbles out, make sure you squeeze it. I use a pair of tongs and I grab onto that bag and I twist it and push it up against the sides so that it, you know, I get as much wax as I can out of there. Then you turn the stove off. You let the whole pot cool. Don't mess with it. Just let it cool on the countertop overnight. And when you wake up in the morning, you will have a disc of wax on top of your pot, like this. So this came right out of the pot, and I did that a few weeks ago. And um, it's kind of junky, um, but you can take this off. And then what you can do with it, if you wanted to make it a little bit cleaner, is you can break it up and um, put in a double boiler on the stove and melt it down and then pour it through a coffee filter. And what you'll come out with is something that looks a little more like this, okay? So that's how to purify your wax at home on the stove. Super easy, everybody has a pot, you know. I use this pot for canning. I can get it pretty clean. I don't feel like it's, you know, I don't dedicate this pot just to this. So it's my multi-use so pot. How do you clean the pot? <clears throat> hot water. I get really, yeah, you can dedicate a pot. Um, I use really hot water and then I use a paper towel and I wipe the sides of the pot with the paper towel and all the wax comes off on the paper towel and the pot's completely clean. You can also buy used pots at Goodwill's or Big Shop. Yes, so yeah. To, you can dedicate a pot. My, I'm really, I don't like to have a hundred pots in my house. Um, I do dedicate a um, crock pot for my wax when I make candles, so I do dedicate that. But I like to have multi-use things in my kitchen, and you know, this is it's easy enough for me to clean, so I don't have to dedicate a pot from that. So that's one way to do it at home that's really easy and simple. Another way to do it, this is my homemade sort of ghetto wax melter <laughs> that you could make at home too. It's a box, you could use a cooler, and then inside I took one of those styrofoam coolers that you can buy at Publix and I lined it with tin foil, and then the lid of that styrofoam cooler is also plastered with tin foil, and then it, I just got, bought a piece of plexiglass, you could take a piece of glass out of a frame or whatever, and put it on top, and then I taped it so that it's, you know, the heat stays in that box. I painted the outside black, and I put a bowl in there, and then I put a piece of mesh screen, you know, that you use to screen up your hive, or if you have screen bottom boards, it's the same kind of mesh, that hardware cloth. And then I put a piece of paper towel down on top of the mesh. And then I put my wax on top of the paper towel. And this is literally what you get out of it. It's all clean. It goes through the paper towel. And when you're finished, the paper towel looks all brown and gross. Um, you can kind of see the paper towel brown and gross. And then there's some wax that hasn't melted yet. So you could, it could be this easy. I know CG made a solar wax melter in like a wheelbarrow or something, right? It was a, a Xerox box and I just put it in the box inside a big <coughs> plastic bag, stapled the bag down inside and then I just put my pot with water and the screen inside that and a piece of plastic, the plastic, the plexiglass across the top. So it can be that easy. Um, if it's not a hot day, yeah. <laughs> it might take months. <laughs> um, and mine will not work if it's not summer or late spring. So I had this sitting out there trying to melt wax in the winter. 
did not work. So if you want to melt wax in the um, winter, then you can use this amazing solar wax melter that Eric Baxter built. And we're actually going to raffle one off tonight at the end of the meeting. So if you haven't bought your raffle tickets, please buy raffle tickets. So this is the glass top. There's sealant here, you know, there's seal all the way around. So when that goes on top, it seals really nice. And um, it's a little stinky in here because I'm going to show you this old, old comb that he has in here. Feel free to come up and look at this after the meeting um, and purchase as many raffle tickets as you think you need, need to be able to win it because I know a lot of people are hoping to win this um, solar wax melter. And it'll be a new and improved version. Like I said, Eric was supposed to be here but had to go out of town. He will hand deliver it to you. This week. <laughs> so inside, that's what smells. It's old, nasty comb, okay, that's in here. And then this melts and goes through these little holes here. And, what, and then in the bottom, there's another tray that has nice, clean wax in it. This wax came out of that comb. Does all this come with? All this comes with. So you can open it up, throw your stuff in here, and it's ready to go. Another really cool thing about this is it will fit a full 10 frame box. So you just put the whole 10 frame deep in there and put the lid on top, and it will... Take the beans well, yeah, out. Take, yeah, <laughs> not with beans. <laughs> Unless you weren't able to solve your hot hive problems that Al gave you. That'll fix it. <laughs> um, so it, it'll come like this, and in the back here, um, come up and look at this after the meeting. In the back, it's got PVC pipe that you can unscrew and make go up and down to, so that you can get a better angle on the sun. So Eric really thought of everything. This thing's amazing, and he's built one for us to auction off tonight. And I want to win it, so don't let me forget to buy my raffle tickets. Um, so that's wax, basically, okay? Um, then, I mean, if you, I, I make dip candles. My kids love to make dip candles. That's as experienced as I am with making candles. I know you can buy molds at Joanne or Michael's or online or South Florida Bee Supplies. I think Gloria was saying that she's getting ready to get some mold, candle molds in. Um, but you would basically heat this in a double boiler or like I said, I have a crock pot dedicated to wax. And then what works really well for making dip candles is I get one of some of those, um, tall candles that you can buy at Publix, you know, in the glass jars. They're like the Mexican in the, uh, what are, religious aisle. They're in the religious section, those tall. So the glass one. So my neighbor gave me some just empty glass, so because I don't need the candle inside. So I put my melted wax in there and then I just dip my candle in there and it makes a nice tall candle. And the big thing with that is you have to make sure that you get a wick that is specifically for beeswax candles. Otherwise, your candles won't burn right. No, not that I know of. She might be getting those in with her candle molds, but they do sell beeswax um, wicks at Joanne or Michael's craft store. Um, and you can get a 40% off coupon, and so that's really cool. A paper towel is a good, good. A paper towel? The, the core, you know, is a good thickness for, so it doesn't drip. Oh. What? You just you make it inside the, like you pour, it in the paper towel. pour it in the paper towel holder. That's a brilliant. That I love that. No, no, no. That's your mold. That would be your mold. And you know what I mean. Glenn says you use up the roll of paper towels or toilet paper, and you have that little cardboard roll tube left. You can use that as a mold. Pour the wax inside of it. Put your wick in and um, pour about an inch in first so it doesn't leak out. Okay, pour an inch in first so that it doesn't leak out the bottom. Let that harden and then make dip, you dip your wick is a good idea. It makes it nice and hard. <laughs> uh, firm. Well, that, that's important when you're making um, dip candles actually is to dip the wick a couple times so it gets nice and firm. Okay, so that's pretty much it for wax. Does anybody have any questions about that? I'm going kind of quick because Al took up a lot of time. I'll blame it on him. Yes. Um, just another suggestion. I found uh, a wax melter for people who like to wax their eyebrows. Oh, and, and you can just use straight beeswax? Yes, luckily. <gasps> That's awesome. <laughs> oh, my gosh. For the sake of the video, say that. 
So the, she brought up, um, Carol, right? Carol brought up that you can use your wax and melt it down and use it to wax your hair off. <laughs> your unwanted, your unwanted hair. Um, I'll experiment with that and let you know how it goes. <laughs> In some areas that aren't too sensitive to start off. Okay, so uh, any other questions or, or comments or suggestions for wax? Now that Lee's stuck on waxing. Okay. <clears throat> so now here's another thing you can do with products from your hive using your honey, okay? And when somebody first told me about using honey in products, you know, like in a body scrub, or I thought, oh my gosh, honey is so precious because, you know, I'm a brand new beekeeper and thinking about using my honey just to wash down the drain seems ridiculous. But if you have honey that's kind of funky, or, you know, if you did a cutout that you knew wasn't sprayed or something like that, that's perfect honey to do stuff like this with. Or if you're like me and this bag was sitting on top of your bucket for like two weeks in the kitchen and the honey at the bottom is really thick and you think, oh, I don't want to, I'm not going to sell this to anybody or I'm not going to eat it myself. Perfect honey to do this with. So we sell this through the club. This is our honey sea salt body scrub. It's really easy. I modified the recipe. So instead of making a five gallon bucket full of it, you can make something that's a little bit more manageable. We'll do it really quick. Um, I made the recipe for one container of salt. So you go and you buy one container of the sea salt. It's about a dollar seventy-five or something. Pour the whole thing in there. Oat flour, you just take oatmeal and you put it in the blender or Vitamix or whatever and blend it up so now you have oat flour. So it's one container of the sea salt, one cup of oat flour, half of a pound of honey. By, by weight? By weight. By weight. Half, half a honey bear. You know what I mean? Eight ounces. No, uh, it's five ounces because honey is 10.6 fluid ounces per weight pound. Um, so it would be about five ounces of honey. I think, I, no, I didn't put that on there. So about five ounces of honey, and then one and a half cups of coconut oil. I get this great coconut oil at Costco. It's fantastic price. Um, and then 20 drops each of geranium and bergamot um, essential oils. And you can use whatever you want, whatever essential oils you like. Um, if you're putting this on your body and going out in the, you know, after you get out of the shower and going into the sun, look up your essential oils. I'll give you a resource um, in a few minutes on where to look those things up to make sure you're not using essential oils that become toxic in the sun. Or uh, you can buy these at Whole Foods. Um, any natural like health food store, you can buy those. Trader Joe's has some. Yeah. Oh my God. How excited are we that we have Trader Yay. Joe's here now? Woo! I'm a California girl, so I've been ha used to Trader Joe's and missing it since I moved here. Um, yes. Oh, sorry. Grapefruit and bergamot. That's what it is. I like geranium, and so that's probably what flew off the top of my head. Thank you, Peter. Um, so I was going to mix that up and show you how easy it was. It really is super easy. You throw all the ingredients in there, and you mix it up. And then I use this little thing so it's less messy to scoop it into here. But I'm not going to go through that because we're short on time. Um, so then another thing you can do is make um, a face and body cream or lotion or something like that. This is sort of, um, you know, for me, out of the products that I make, the most complicated. So I'm starting here, and then I'll give you some really simple recipes to, to do other things. Um, so for perfect face and body cream, the recipe is here. Um, you have oils and waters. So it, the first thing you're going to do, and see, I use a, a blend of oils um, based on the skin type that I have or the skin type of the person that I'm making it for. And you can go to this recipe here, naturalfacialrecipes.homestead.com. All this will be on the website. Greg's videoing it, so don't feel like you have to write it down right now. But this website's awesome. We'll go to it right now. They give you um, pages that show you what carrier oils and what essential oils are good for what skin type. Because I'm sure you've all used a product and you thought, gosh, this is really too greasy for my skin. The oil stays on my skin for too long. Um, I want something that soaks in. And some people say, well, I don't want any oil. Well, oil is great for your skin. You just need the right oil for your skin type. 
So if you go down here, um, carrier, carrier oil profiles for skin. So sweet almond oil doesn't clog the skin. It's greatly moisturizing and softening. And then it tells you the usage amount, um, where it says here that it can be used at 100% strength, OK? Not all oils can be used as 100% strength. Um, uh, apricot kernel normally used at 10 to 50 percent. Avocado oil will really sit on the skin. It's, it will leave things really greasy. Um, so people normally use it about 10 to 20 percent. I don't use it at all in mine. So how do you break that down? Um, by weight or by ounces. So if it's a cup of oils that you're using in the recipe, you know, um, I like to use. Let me go back to that slide that I had. Um, I like to use a blend of jojoba, sweet almond, hemp, hazelnut, coconut, rosehip seed oil, and cranberry seed oil. So I would say use like about a quarter cup of coconut oil, maybe a quarter cup of jojoba, a quarter cup of um, either sweet almond, hemp, or hazelnut. Hazelnut's a little astringent. It'll, um, it's really good for oiler, oilier skins, and it'll absorb right into the skin and not be greasy at all. Hemp is really good for more mature skin types and very good for the skin. Um, rose hip seed and cranberry seed oils are really good um, for mature skin and anti-aging and all that stuff. So like, you just use a little bit, like maybe half of an ounce or a quarter of an ounce, depending on how big of a batch you're making. So you can go there and look for that. Um, they have the same thing for the essential oil. So you go and you look at the essential oils page and it'll show you um, for um, skin care. So it says essential oils for acne, essential oils for combo, essential oils for dry, mature, oily, sensitive. So I use a blend that's pretty much good for all of them. I use geranium, um, I use Roman chamomile, I use lavender, I use carrot seed because carrot seed oil is really good for mature skin type. Um, so I use those. Basically that's what I use, those four. Um, and I haven't had any complaints so far. Um, it, a warning, I was just talking with a friend, the friend that I first started making face cream with about five years ago. She and I would make it and we'd like give a jar away. I think we started making it for Mother's Day one year and we gave a couple jars out. Then every single time you make it, everybody says, I need another jar of that. And you know, the ingredients are quite costly and everybody wants it. So now I do sell it. Um, and people love it. I mean, it's, it's great stuff. So this is my kitchen set up when I'm ready to make it. Um, I like to have things nice and clean. I'm a little bit, um, I like to make sure that I keep my jars sterile. I like to make sure that everything's really clean because I don't, the only preservative that's in here is vitamin A. I don't put anything funky in it. There's nothing that you can't read in the label. It's all really clean and really fresh and I do end up having to put it in the fridge if I'm not gonna use the jars right away. Um, so I make my own rose hydrosol. You can buy rose water, you can buy rose hydrosol and that makes it really easy. But basically I make a little mini distiller, a simple distiller, where I put the rose petals in the pot, I put an empty bowl in the center of the rose petals that have water in them, in the middle of the pot, and then I put the lid on upside down. And I turn on the heat, and as the heat comes up, it vaporizes the water that's around those rose petals. It comes to the lid, it condenses because I put ice there, and it drip, it goes to the center of the lid because it's bowed in, and it falls into that, um, the center bowl. So you can do this with anything. You could do it with, you, you could make a high, lavender hydrosol if you want. Um, I like rose because it's a little bit astringent. Um, so I make that first. And while I'm making that, I start to heat up my oils and my wax, okay? Um, and that, this is the most time consuming part, um, is making sure, because you know, I'm using a hunk of beeswax. I don't have nice little beeswax pellets that, that um, melt really fast. So I make, I heat the oils on the stove. Then I put them in the refrigerator, okay? And you really have to watch the step, otherwise you're gonna have to remelt it. <laughs> so you want it to get just barely starting to solidify. It'll be like a film of hard on the side and maybe on the edges of the bowl. That's the time when you take it out, you get your little blender ready. Okay. And um, I, I just use a hand blender. Um, we used to use a Vitamix and it drove me nuts trying to get it all out of the Vitamix after. So. <laughs> Um, so you just take that blender and you start whipping it and then you start pouring, pouring your waters which is your aloe and the rose hydrosol. You pour that in there, you start whipping it up um, 
and you just keep whipping until you feel like it's good. Then you stop and you scrape down the sides of the bowl and you keep whipping it up till you till everything's incorporated and everything is smooth. You don't want lumps of your beeswaxy oil in there. You just whip it up till it's smooth. And this recipe is pretty foolproof. So um, when I first started making it, I would do the water really waters really slow because I had a couple of batches where I added too much waters and then after a week of sitting on the counter in the fridge, it started to separate. This recipe is pretty foolproof. The, the measurements are, are pretty good. Um, so scrape the sides down, do it again, and voila! You pour into your sterilized jars. You, I like to refrigerate it until I'm ready to use it, um, but it will keep on the countertop for at least a couple of months. That's face cream. Any questions? <laughs> I did. I, am, I did bring some with me to sell tonight. Um, I think I have like 10 or 15 jars. Um, and I will donate $5 of every jar to the club tonight that, that I sell. And it sells for $15 for a four ounce jar. Comes in these really beautiful cobalt blue jars. And it's fresh. It was just made this week. Um, so now what you, Sierra, yes. What happens after this time frame? If, you know, once you've gone past the refrigeration of the shelf life, what happens? I've never had a jar go bad. But it potentially will because the only preservative in it is vitamin E. Is that face, face and body. I, I, I lather up my body after I get out of the shower, clean shaven. I use it on my face. <laughs> Lee's blushing. Yes. I, well, I, I, I apply liberally. You know, I take a handful. You know, if I'm going to do my whole body, I take a, you know. A, it, it is really rich, so you can experiment with it. I mean, I go through an eight ounce jar in a month. So, but you know, I don't use it on my whole body every day. It's just, you know, after I shave or. Yeah, I'm really 60 years old. <laughs> this is what I look like now. Um, no, but I, I don't use sunscreen or anything, so my skin kind of takes a beating. Okay, any other questions about the face cream? Okay, so now what can you do with this? You can make lip balm, you can make salves, you can make shaving cream. I brought shaving cream also. I'll give you that recipe in a minute. Um, body butter and a body lotion bar. And those, all of those things, with the exception of the shaving cream, is basically doing the oils por portion of the face cream. So that melting the oils and the beeswax together, um, and maybe but if you wanted to use shea butter or um, cocoa butter or illipi butter or cocum butter, any of those butters, you can use in these recipes. Um, so these are basically just doing that first part of the face cream um, with the oils and then pouring it into whatever little container you want it in. <clears throat> so a basic lip balm formula, 40% of your recipe should be any cosmetic grade oil that is liquid at room temperature. And it gives you a list and you can go to that website and figure out which oils you want to use based on what you're making it for. 25% of your recipe should be any cosmetic grade oil that is solid at room temperature. Coconut, I wouldn't use 25% lanolin, that would be a little freaky. Um, palm, mango butter, shea butter, and like I said, cocoa butter, um, illipi butter, those What's things. Mango, butter? mango seed butter. It's really nice. Actually, mango butter has an SPF, I think, of eight. So you can use mango butter alone as an SPF. Um, is skin protection. And it's it got a really nice consistency. Unless you're allergic to mangoes. Yeah. Uh, unless you're allergic to mangoes. Yeah, I've never thought about that. Usually it's the skin. Most people are allergic to the skin, not what's inside. Yeah, but I wouldn't. Don't use it. Don't use mango butter if you're allergic. Um, and then 20% of your recipe should be cosmetic grade beeswax. Okay, so we all have our little, I call this cosmetic grade good enough for me. Um, and then 15% of your recipe should be any cosmetic grade oil that is brittle at room temperature. Okay, cocoa butter, palm kernel oil. Um, you can tell the difference when you look at the butters. Like uh, I used cocoa butter in the shaving cream and I mean it's brittle. You know, when you go to chop a chunk off, it's, you know, it flakes off and gets crumbly. Whereas the shea butter I'm using, or yeah, shea butter I'm using a tablespoon and scooping it out. That's how soft it is. So you can do that, you melt it just like you know I showed you in the face cream recipe and then you would just pour it into little lip balm tubes or bowls or um, something like that. So pretty easy. Sierra, uh -huh. you get full grade uh, shea butter? I, uh, Mountain Rose Herbs is a really fantastic website. Their prices have gotten insane over the past few years. When I started ordering five years ago and making all this stuff, 
things were really cheap. Now it's like twice as expensive. So I get a lot of it on Amazon. Um, I have prime shipping, so I go to Amazon and I order it. I've priced it out a little bit, so some things I get at Mountain Rose. Um, if it's too heavy, if it's heavy stuff, um, the shipping at Mountain Rose is insane. So I just get it at Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, we have signs in our garden that tell everyone that we're pesticide. I love those signs. They're great signs. Uh, it's a sign that says that your yard is pesticide free and has a little girl with a watering can, oh. right? And there's little bees flying around her and maybe there's a dog in it. They're really, really cute signs. I have seen those there before. Um, it is a great site. They have amazing things. You have too. Of course you do. <laughs> um, okay, so then here's another recipe for a healing salve. I've made this before. These infused oils, I got my herbs from Mountain Rose Herbs. I put them in a big mason jar. I filled it with olive oil and I set, let it sit for a couple of weeks and then you ha strain it and you have an infused oil. So you can use whatever you want. This is my healing salve, uh, calendula, comfrey, plantain, um, St. John's wort if you want. Um, then beeswax, vitamin E is a preservative, essential oil, um, lavender. And if you don't have yarrow, because yarrow, and I mean, I grew it in my yard so that I could do it myself. Um, they also have yarrow essential oils at Mountain Rose Herbs that you can use instead. You melt that all together again in the double boiler on the stove, really easy. Pour it into little tins. It makes a really nice healing salve. So that's that. Yeah. Amazon. You can get some of the things at Whole Foods, but it'll be a lot more expensive. Yeah, you just you type it into Amazon, which you know, you know it'll come up. And so I use all organic things in mine. I don't use anything that's not organic. Um, and I've priced it out, so some things are cheaper on Amazon. Pretty much nothing is cheaper at Whole Foods. <laughs> their, ver their oils are ridiculously, yeah, they're rid ridiculously expensive. Um, okay, so shaving cream is a little different, and it has honey in it. What do you need, Peter? Oh, yes, Ben. Uh, I was going to say, I don't remember they use honey to help heal the turtles. They absolutely do. They do. Uh, right there, who works at Gumbo Limbo, and I oh. invited her. Thank you for coming. You know what? You might be interested in seeing Dr. Vitaly Stashenko's talk. It's on the website. Um, Greg videoed that one, and he spoke about the healing properties of honey and different recipes. So thank you, Ben. Thanks for bringing that up. That's really important. Um, so shaving cream is a little bit different. It's a little easier. You don't really have to heat anything up. Um, the, the shea butter and coke are, um, you have to heat up a little bit, but it's, a, it's much faster. You would heat up the coconut oil, the shea butter or cocoa butter. I use shea butter. I like that a little bit better. And then the recipe that I had called for um, honey or aloe or a combo of the two. And I'd always made it before with aloe and never used the honey. And this week I decided to make it half and half honey and it turned out really nice. Um, and then it's got cosmetic clay in it and baking soda and castile soap. You basically melt the oils together, you let them cool just a little bit, and then you use that little immersion blender and you put everything else in and whip it up till it gets nice and frothy. These were sitting in the car and so they got a little bit more liquid, but if you put them back in the refrigerator at home, they'll, they'll be okay sitting out on the countertop um, as long as you cool them back down. They got a little liquid, but it makes a really nice lathery um, shaving cream um, that's natural. Um, while I was at the Organic Beekeepers Conference, D. Lesby's Organic Beekeepers Conference in Arizona, um, Don Downs, who's an apotherapist, you know, nationally known apotherapist, was there speaking. And he was selling his hand cream in the parking lot after, you know, at the end of the conference. And I, I was thinking, oh, I don't need any of this hand cream, you know, I make my own stuff. And Dean, from D you know, Dean and Ramona, who are here speaking, the authors of The Complete Idiot's Guide to Beekeeping, Dean said to me, oh my gosh, Sierra, you have to buy some of Dawn's cream. He goes, I buy it every year, it's amazing, you know, and he's like, I'm buying three jars or something like that. So we all run over to Dawn and, and we start purchasing our stuff and um, I, said, I asked him, I said, how do you make it? And he right there 
rattled off the recipe to me and I quickly jotted it down in my, in my phone, in my notes section. And it's really easy to make. It's got oil. He didn't tell me what kind of oil he used. Uh, so that's, that's, probably, that's probably why he was so easy to give it to me. But you could really you choose from that list of oils and you'll get the properties out of the cream that you want. Um, distilled water. And distilled water is really important. Or that rose hydrosol that I make where it's going through the distil you know, a simple distillation process. Um, is really important because if you don't have everything really clean and you don't use distilled water, you will get mold growing in your cream. So that's really important for all of these recipes that use any water or aloe or anything is that you, you're really clean throughout your process and if it calls for distilled water, use distilled water. Don't use tap water. Um, and he, in his recipe, he told me, I use an ounce of propolis tincture for every 240 ounces of cream. So I googled how many drops are in an ounce. And so I figured out it's about three drops of propolis tincture per small batch like this. What's a propolis tincture? What's a propolis tincture? That's a great question. Again, I would listen to Vitaly Stashenko's talk. But propolis tincture is taking propolis out of the hive and putting it in a jar. Um, and adding alcohol to cover it and then sitting it in the back of the pantry and letting it sit for a couple weeks, couple months. Um, Dawn Downs actually recommended not using Florida propolis, which is something that, you know, I don't know a lot about, but he said that we don't have a lot of natural plants in Florida that the bees can collect propolis from. So bees collect propolis in Florida from a lot of really dirty sources. From the caulking on the windowsill, from the grease around your hive stand, you know, if you're trying to prevent ants from crawling up, to tar on the road. He said it, the he would not use Florida propolis. So I actually, when I was at that organic beekeepers conference, bought some of Dee Lesby's propolis, because her propolis is, I mean, she's in the middle of nowhere and she's, <coughs> arguably the cleanest beekeeper in the United States. And um, so I bought some of her propolis and I also bought a little jar of Sam Comfort's propolis tincture that he gathers from his New York bees. Um, so propolis, yeah? What kind of alcohol would you use to make the tincture? Everclear? That's what it's called, right? The <laughs> 150? No, 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 no. Not rubbing alcohol. No. Everclear, grain. grain alcohol. The highest grain alcohol. That's Everclear. That's what that's called, right? Yeah. Yes. You, or you could use vodka or gin. Um, you just want as high a proof as you can get is, is preferable when you're making propolis tincture. Uh huh. Mule team borax. Uh huh. So, and the reason that you use borax is because beeswax is not an emulsifier. But if you add borax and beeswax together, the heating process and mixing those things together, they become an emulsifier. And then you won't have the problem like I was having in the initial stages of making my cream. After a week sitting out, the wa some of the waters would start to separate out from the solution because oil and water doesn't mix. So borax and beeswax together are actually an emulsifier and it will keep those oils and waters together in the cream. Um, some people say, I really don't want to use borax because it's awful. So um, it's your choice. Uh -huh. Really, one thing is that uh, twice a year I use mule borax, half a cup to a gallon of water, and feed all my palms. Really? What does that do? It's a um, um, borax. micro or, uh, nutrient that is not found in many palm fertilizers. So <coughs> really? It doesn't kill a lot of no. stuff? Because borax is a pesticide, I thought. It kills ants. It's used in ant bait, right? No, that's boric acid. That's different. Okay. I don't know anything about that. <laughs> I know. I don't know. So that's interesting. That's good to know, Donna. Thank you. So now I'm finished. Does anybody have any questions? And Jan's going to talk about making soap. I'm Jan, Jan Comos. I've been a beekeeper for a little over a year, thanks to Jim and Mary Ann and Al and my husband here, Greg, who agreed to let us do it. <laughs> so, anyway, I have a few passions in life. One is bees, one is making jewelry, one is making soap, and there's a lot of other things thrown in there, too. But um, 
Uh, the reason we started making soap is because it seems like all my siblings and I have become very sensitive to everything commercial. And uh, come to find out, even though all of us think we're using soap every day, most of us are not. Because if you're using anything that comes in a box like this, if you look on it, it does not say soap because it is not. It'll say bar. Or like this lever says nothing. It says absolutely nothing about it. It says replenishes and refreshes with nutrients and minerals. Not a thing about soap. It doesn't even say it cleanses you. Or Dove. Moisturizing Lotion Beauty Bar. No mention of soap. Why do you think they have to put moisturizing lotion in it? Because it's a detergent. All these are detergents. They have taken the glycerin out and so they can use it on everything else and make a lot more money. They use glycerin in all kinds of cosmetics, everything you can think of. They've used glycerin, and they also make gl clear glycerin soap that they can sell out for a lot more money because it's so pretty. But it doesn't do anything extra for you. All it does is melt a lot quicker, and you have to buy it more often. Now, one thing about homemade soap, it costs a lot more to make than any one of these bars. Even the expensive ones, it's going to cost you more because what I put in it, or most anybody you put in it, a lot higher quality things. And uh, it's a little tricky to make if you're trying to uh, put, I'd say, like I make a special facial soap my sister and I developed for uh, ladies over a certain age that we really like. <laughs> and uh, it has some expensive oils in it. But I tell you what, it's one of the most popular so soaps I make. So anyway, there are a few rules because it is a chemical reaction and you can get hurt with it really fast because you cannot make soap without lye. So, okay, soap is a chemical reaction. See, uh, you, like she was talking about an emulsifier, you cannot make soap without lye because, as you know, water and oil don't mix. They call it kind of a snake with two ends, with one end that loves water and the one end that hates water. But in the middle, where you get soap, they've learned to coexist. And uh, it's actually the sudging, sudging action is from the... Uh, that's where it comes from, where they're actually getting together and making soap. And um, soap was invented, or I should say, rather discovered, the legend goes, in Greece, on the island of Lesbos. Um, they were doing uh, animal sacrifices up on the mountain, and during the rainstorms, uh, the water would flow down through the ashes into the river. And the ladies noticed after the rains, when the water was yellow, their clothes would get cleaner when they washed them in the river. And it was because of the action of the ash water and the animal fats combining, making soap. So that is where it's believed it first happened. So anyway, um, saponification is the action of the lye and the fats that make soap. So that is what you're going for. Glycerin is the part that they take out of the soap, as we talked about. Detergents, what you have left when you take out the glycerin, or you don't even use the correct, you don't even use oils, and you make it another way around. Like um, Dove was at least soap in the beginning, and then they added salt, added alcohol, and then pulled out the glycerin. Lever. Never was so, ever. Didn't start that way, didn't end up that way. Okay, the process I use is cold process. All that means is the only thing I do is warm up the solid oils. That's it. That's the only thing I do, only part of heat. There's a bunch of other ones here. I'm not really going to go over them because we're not doing it. Melt and pour is a... Uh, uh, 
one that you buy, you can buy in Michael's. All you do is put it in the microwave, melt it, and pour it in. And it is a type of glycerin soap for the most part. Okay, these trace, gel stage, and cure are the stages it has to go through, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, sap value is uh, sapination. Uh, each oil has a different value, and we'll, we'll get to why that's important um, later. Unsap, blah, blah, what that says there, I can't say that word, uh, are oils that will never turn into soap. And one of those is beeswax. It will never become soap, but what it does add is a nice fine texture to soap. It makes it very slippery and feels very nice on the skin. All right, oh, whoops, don't do that. All right, safety. Although, do as I say, not as I do. We won't talk about that. You're supposed to wear goggles, wear a mask when you're mixing your Y. Um, now, this is something I for sure do. I always wear, I always pour, shut up. <laughs> you always pour your light into the water, never the verse, because uh, it can bubble up and grab you. But it, putting the lye into the water really helps. So, uh, it does have a smell. It gets worse in humid times. So in Florida, summer, you gotta watch out because if you're making a large batch, it will get in your face. Don't breathe deep. Ask me how I know. <laughs> and it does go up, so put your face down. So anyway, um, I always, um, We'll, we'll get to this later. Okay, um, rubber gloves, vinegar deactivates lye, and it deactivates newly battered soap. My sister flung some on her nose, didn't notice, and it did burn her nose pretty badly. Um, okay, no kids, no pets. I'm going to kill you. Um, <laughs> So no spouses. Protect work surfaces. Newspapers is okay too, or towels. Um, also, once you start using something for soap making, you can't use it for food anymore. Okay. There we go. That's what I said. This is a soap calculator. This is very important. Uh, when you're starting to, to uh, soap make, you need to always check your recipes against the soap calculator because you know how it is when you pull something off the internet there's always can be a typo and you can have a big stinking mess all right basic lard soap we are making we made gardener soap which is this and we made it in a very simple way lard very nice a very nice mild soap uh, Olive oil, got it from Costco. They actually have the best price. The lard came from Walmart. The coconut oil I had from my favorite place, Essential Depot, but the co coconut oil from Costco is great. And uh, castor oil you can get from any pharmacy or from Walmart. And uh, the lye, mm, I get it from Sebring at a place called Essential Depot. It's a great place and it's close and you can get 20% off shipping every time you buy it if you put the correct code in, which is SHIP20. <laughs> <laughs> Are you talking about Sebring, Florida, west of here? North and, north and Little West, yes. Oh, and they also on Thursday, is it Thursday? It's either Thursday or Friday if you drive up there, they have wine bar. <laughs> <laughs> and they give a they give a free walking stick away, really nice one if you go up there and visit them. And what's the name of this shop? It's called Essential Depot. They have all kinds of stuff. They have really uh, they have all organic uh, essential oils. They have a lot of stuff. Like is it just downtown I I don't I don't know if it's downtown Sebring. It's on the edge of the lake. Um, we flew into there, the little airport, and then a cab took us around. It was like 20 minutes, 15 minutes or something around. 
I don't know. I didn't derive it. It was, it was quite a little hike, actually. Okay. Uh, here are the goodies here. Uh, I wanted to make this so anybody could make this soap. I use for mold the Silk Creamer one quart box here. It makes a really cute bar of soap, as you can see, nice and square, cut into one inch blocks. Uh, you need a postal scale, an accurate postal scale that will stay on when you touch it. Uh, the lye is in that uh, bottle there. Gloves, measuring things, the honey. Uh, that pan is up there because uh, when I do bigger batches, I use a pan like that. Higher is better than wider. Um, we put cornmeal in it because this is a gardener's soap and it makes a great scrubby. It's great for your feet too. And actually you can use it any part of you, but it's really good for your hands and your feet. I used it today when I shaved my legs. I, it ex like exfoliated at the same time as soaked me up. It's a, it's a good one. Um, I have some uh, ca uh, calamine soap that's good for that, that reddish one. It's a little redder than it should be, but that's good for that. Um, these are dollar store items. These are Goodwill Faith Farm items. Actually, all this stuff is, the little stuff there is all Faith Farm, dollar store dollar store faith farm uh, I love buying things to re I mean that are repurposed and uh, Pyrex bowls the measuring cups you don't have to have a uh, measuring marks on them because you weigh everything everything's by weight and plus then you get the benefit of the Pyrex being able to put it in the microwave without exploding so uh, stick blender extremely important so um, here we go Here's the equipment, digital scale, yes. Stainless pot if you're making a bigger uh, recipe than the one I was. Uh, heavy plastic pitcher, that is for mixing your lye. You want it deep, you know, deep and heavy because you don't not want it to bend at all. Okay, um, a batter bowl. I use that generally for mixing out my oils, the different ones. But this one, this time, I also used it for mixing my actual batters. And it was such a small uh, batch. Stick blender, I mentioned. Two candy thermometers, one for the lye, one for uh, the oils. And then various and sundry little bowls, measuring cups, uh, spoons. Uh, the whisk is for mixing the lye. Uh, I also like to use ice cream scoops for for the oils, the solid oils, obviously. And molds, molds can be anything. You don't have to have a fancy wooden mold. Um, these work. Just put a, a little freezer paper in there. Works great, makes a cute little loaf mold. Um, you can also use ice cube, ice cube trays. Any silicone mold will work. Yeah, like these will make really cute Christmas soaps. So there's a lot of things you can, yeah, actually ice cube trays work really well too. Um, all right, all right. This is really a simple, fast way that uh, we did it at uh, Sarah's house. It worked really well. All right, here's our recipe we talked about already. Uh, when I get the recipe off, out of the calculator, I round it down, or round it up or down, depending, and so it's easy for me to uh, to do because they, when you get off the calculator, it's to the tenth uh, uh, point ten thousand, and uh, my my wear only goes to the tenth. So I always fix it so I don't get confused because if you mismeasure your oils, you'll have a failed recipe. I refrigerate my distilled water, measure it, and then I freeze it. But this helps everything go faster, and uh, I'm all for easy. I fill the sink with water that I can put my pitcher in with my distilled water that it's not going to dump over. Uh, you weigh the lye into a two-cup 
measuring cup, glass measuring cup, and then slowly sprinkle the lye into um, in the water, distilled water in the pitcher. It's either, it can be any form of cold to frozen, it doesn't matter because it will melt. And then just stir it till it's mixed. The lye that I use from Essential Depot is micro uh, beads and it dissolves very quickly. Most everybody else sells flakes and it's a lot more aromatic. Uh, the micro beads are food grade and um, I don't know, well maybe they use it to make lutefisk or something I, I, that grows Norwegian stuff or they also use, Germans use it to make pretzels somehow but I don't know what else, what they eat. How many grits? Huh? How many, how many corn? How many corn? Oh, how many? That's right. How many? No, you're right. So, um, and the flake stuff a lot of time is tech grade. Do not use red lye, I mean, red devil drain cleaner. It is not pure lye. Um, then it'll make your soap a lot harsher. Uh, soap is also really hydrophilic. It will not, I mean, uh, lye is really hydrophilic. It will not come all the way out of the, uh, the cup when you dump it. So you have to have a spoon ready to help it in and then dump all your equipment that's touched the lye into the sink full of water because it will burn you. Also, this is one thing I had to really be careful of because I, when I had dogs, is uh, if any of the little microbeads fell on the floor, then your dogs sniff it up. They have lye particles in their nose. So you have to watch and be very, very careful. Uh, I used to, when I was new at this, I, I would mix it in the uh, sink in the garage. But as I got better at it, I'd do it in the house. So just keep that in mind. Um, Anyway, so uh, a gray film a lot of times form on the top of the lye water. That's okay. So after you have it mixed, just leave it in the sink until you're ready for it and let it uh, cool down. You can just drop your candy, candy thermometer in it and s swish it around every time you need to check the temperature. You want it to drop to around 100. All right, here we are measuring the lye. And um, here's the pitcher in the sink of ice water. Uh, Whey solid oils and I put it in the microwave instead of putting it on the um, uh, stove. I just like it better, it doesn't heat my house up and uh, I can control how fast it melts better. I only like it melted, just melted and when it's clear. We got a little hot at Sierra's and we had to wait for it to cool down. We actually had to put the oils into the ice water to cool it down. Otherwise, it'd still be there, I think. Um, then you weigh the liquid oils separately and set them aside. And you just keep checking back and forth to see how melted the solid ones are and then how cool the uh, lye is. Usually. It doesn't take that long because you haven't gotten either the the lye hasn't gotten that hot because it was made with cold water and it's sitting in the sink full of ice water and then you're putting the melted oils in with room temperature uh, liquid oils so it all kind of comes about pretty quick. So when, uh, then while you're still waiting, you weigh out your essential oils and anything else you happen to have in the recipe. That's what you do until it gets incorporated. Then you can add, like we did the cornmeal, which I don't measure it. I do it till it looks like I want it, until you think it looks scrubby enough. And then um, I add the honey and the vitamin, oil, vitamin E capsule content to squirt it in. Um, anyway, you mix it till it comes to trace. Trace is um, um, when you can see the folds of your blender. Yes, on top is when you dribble it on across, uh, and you can actually. I have a hard time seeing trace, but I know how it acts. But 
usually I have to like look at the side and I can see it laying on the top of the soap batter. It's you just see trails on it. Yeah, it kind of has a sheen, but it looks almost 3D. And uh, yeah, there's thin trays, medium trays, and heavy trays, or thick trays, depending on who you're talking to. But uh, you, you keep stirring, and then when it comes to trays, just starts to trace, you, uh, okay, we missed the picture somewhere. Oh, there it is. Um, you add the scent and you add it slowly, a bit at a time, and then you keep mixing until it goes in. And then pretty much when it, I like to keep going to medium trace when it looks like pretty good pudding, then I'm ready to uh, pour it in the mold. And the mold, like this particular carton, I put a little thin bit of olive oil in and then uh, pour it in. Then button up the top, wrap it in a towel, and put it someplace for no kids or uh, dogs, cats, whatever, are going to knock it over. And then Sierra pulled it out and cut it up. And you have to um, let it cure for about a month. Now, um, the there's... You can be all fancy and buy litmus paper and test it for its pH and so on and so forth, but uh, like I said, the down and dirty way to do it is you touch your tongue to the soap. It does not taste bad at all, but if you feel a pop, a sizzle, anything like that, it's kind of like a mild version of Pop Rocks. The soap's not ready. It still has active lye, but if you don't feel anything, try it out. It should be fine. And uh, I have never been burned by any of my soap if I've done that test first. So um, wooden mold here, I have uh, my teacher, Mary, from Ponte Vedra uh, Soap Shop gave me this, this recipe for making a wooden soap mold. And it's actually very nice. Greg made me a couple of them. And the thing about anything that's not silicone, it has to be lined. Whoops. It has, what did I do, Sierra? It has to be lined with freezer paper. So otherwise you will not get it out. So yes? The wood mold you use it's that over. gives that honeycomb effect? Honeycomb effect? The fridge is on the end, but you have a cutter that makes it rridge. Oh, on oh, your soap, it looks like embossed the on the edge. It's like really there's a little the impression the on the edge here. of the soap. The Which one? Well, you know you do all this fancy stuff. Oh, that's bubble wrap. <laughs> the, the honey soap? Yeah, yeah, that is out of my, my, uh, the, that loaf mold that you saw briefly. Yeah, you put, you put bubble wrap in the bottom, and then you pour the soap, and then you put bubble wrap on the top. Oh, I'm not going to tell anybody that. Yeah, it's so, oh, that's, <laughs> bubble wrap, an amazing thing, right? So uh, anyway, that's about it. Anybody? Is there any other soap makers here besides me? Did, yes. Did you ever pour your soap in Luca so you get post effect? I have. I have. I love that actually. And also sea sponges. Yes, I have. Oh, and what, what is the question? Lufa. Yeah. Pour it in Lufa pieces. Yes. Yes. Anybody else? Yes. Um, you could probably use cut pieces of plastic foundation in the bottom of the mold as well to give it the uh, Probably, yeah. I, I, uh, the only problem with it is uh, it's not flexible. Sometimes it doesn't want to let go. With the with the. Yes, yeah, see, I don't like to use things that aren't natural. Fair enough. Yeah, that's the only thing. Well, I know, but that comes off. Mold release doesn't come off. Mold release is a spray. You know, it's like silicone. Yeah. So, I don't know, that bugs me. But uh, bubble wrap sometimes, it even sticks to the bubble wrap, you have to manipulate it, play with it, baby it. 
rub on it. And... All right, thank you.